I'll start with part two now of the uh, presentation that I'm doing on uh, left Newport before daylight and march to Chad's Ford, a landscape of conflict in the days before the Battle of Brandywine, 1777. Uh, this piece that I'll talk about now kind of leads us from uh, the battlefield at Cooch's Bridge up through the troop movements uh, beginning on the 9th of September and culminating with the American forces beginning to take up positions on the Brandywine. Uh, I had mentioned in part one about a map that I had looked at or that you had, that you had seen, which was a map from the British uh, headquarters. Uh, this is a map prepared by Jacob Broom, who was a citizen of uh, Wilmington. Uh, uh, this is the map that George Washington used. So when you get an opportunity, you can kind of compare and contrast these two maps. It's very clear that Broom's map was made, uh, if he's a surveyor or if he's an uh, engineer, he's not a military engineer. And so his level of detail that he provides on this map while he gives uh, road distances and things and where you go from point A to point B, this is more like a straight line road map and not the true evidence of what the road system looked like. And so you get an idea, uh, I want to zoom in on the area that he identified at Cooch's Bridge uh, and talk a little bit about the Battle of Cooch's Bridge, which occurs on the 3rd of September, 1777, and it's essentially the, the largest land engagement that occurs in the state of Delaware. Uh, this is Broome's drawing of that area. And so you can see where Cooch's Bridge is located, where the Aikens Tavern, which is now the village of Glasgow, is located, and the Christina River. Iron Hill is shown as a large round dot with trees on it. But you see the road system that he shows here is very, very stylized and very straight line. Uh, the road from Aiken's Tavern to Cooch's Bridge is essentially a straight line. And so it, um, the level of detail that Washington had as a map to use is, is really, really kind of rudimentary compared to what the English forces had. Uh, and in our 21st century, where we have maps at our fingertips on Google Earth, this is very, very difficult to use. And, and you gotta, if you begin to think about what your abilities were in the 18th century to use a map and what kind of information was out there and how you gained data about a landscape as you traveled through it, if, if you rely on what people tell you, you rely on somebody telling you, if I take this road to here, I go to this tavern, or if I take this road to here, I go to this person's farm, that's a very, very different way to navigate a landscape that you may or may not be familiar with. I want to talk a little bit about the forces that fought, the, particularly the American forces that were at uh, Cooch's Bridge. They were under a Brigadier General, uh, William Scotch Willie Maxwell. Uh, on paper strength, it was, a, it was a light infantry corps that had been formed about a week before the battle. Uh, there were about 1,000 men in it, or it was supposed to be about 1,000 men. It probably never reached more than about 800. Uh, they were from, uh, drawn from nine different brigades. Uh, from uh, the, the Continental Forces came from Virginia. North Carolina, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Uh, there also were some Delaware militia attached to the unit from Newcastle County. We think that uh, Alan McLean's Corps of uh, Soldiers was also attached to it, at, and the entire company was. But in general, most of these soldiers were drawn from those units as volunteers, and so you didn't get full companies, you got individuals who were being placed into the Light Infantry Corps. The images that you see here are some of the people who were in that Light Infantry Corps that we know about. Uh, Derek Lane was a lieutenant from New Jersey. William Heath was a lieutenant colonel uh, from Virginia. Alexander Martin will go on to be governor of North Carolina. He was a, 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 a colonel at the time. Francis Gurney was a merchant from Philadelphia. He's a major in the Pennsylvania line. And of course, Chief Justice John Marshall that you see in the lower right. He will go on to be Chief Justice of the United States. He was a lieutenant at the, or captain at the time in this battle. Uh, this unit forms for a short period of time. It's formed at the end of August and is disbanded by the end of September. So it's important to know about this group because much of the uh, people who were, a lot of the people who were, who were uh, opposing the advance of the Crown Forces were members of this Light Infantry Corps. The Corps, as I said, was about 800 men but it varied in size as militia units were attached, some cavalry units were attached and then maybe detached. And so it has a kind of a state of flux associated with it all the time. 
The Battle of Cooch's Bridge, because it's that only major land battle in, in the state of Delaware uh, during the American Revolution, it's important to understand. It's the opening engagement of the Philadelphia Campaign, uh, and it's American Light Infantry Forces versus Hessian uh, Jaegers, or Huntsmen, or Light Infantry, and British Light Infantry. What's important also in the studies that we've been doing is that this is not that, that small skirmish that we think occurs at the bridge. Instead, this occurs over a broad area, and uh, the contemporary descriptions, which are coming from drawings and journals of the or, uh, pension records and other items from, of the battle, indicate uh, in first-person descri descriptions that it was bloody, severe, a considerable engagement, and obstinate. Those are certainly not terms you use to describe a short little skirmish. Uh, recently, the, the uh, uh, archaeology that has been done there has shown that there is a lot of evidence of the battle still intact on the ground. Uh, and the state's efforts most recently to uh, acquire the house and the 10 acres around the Cooch property make this something that in the next uh, few years, probably for the 250th anniversary of the war, this will be a site that is a pretty uh, significant and premier place in Delaware. Now, I'm going to move from Iron Hill up to the area around Red Clay Creek, because at about the same time that that battle is occurring, beginning on the 4th of September, uh, the battle's on the 3rd, the British forces defeat the American forces at, uh, at Cooch's Bridge, or Iron Hill. Uh, Maxwell's forces were not intended to defend and, and bring on a major engagement anyway, so they drop back from that position. Washington begins to form a major defensive line in the Red Clay area. And so this is uh, the, the archaeology or the history of this area that we've been looking at. And in particular, a detail of that broom map shows you where the, the American line ranged from, uh, sort of along the Red Clay Creek, ranging from about a 20-foot elevation up to about 120 to 150-foot elevation, uh, with steep embankments and steep lines along the edge of the creek. Um, the red clay defensive line, there are a number of period descriptions that explain what it was, that it was earthworks, it was uh, felled trees that were being placed, artillery positions being built along here. There were few bridge locations that you could cross. Uh, you see them here, Hershey's Bridge, Barker's Bridge, and Robinson's Ford, and the town of Newport at the base. This was a fairly def a significant defensive line. If you look at streams the way they cut through Newcastle County, uh, the Christina River really runs uh, mostly on a uh, east-west line. Um, it curves around the town of Newark and heads north, but uh, much of it, or that's the White Clay Creek, the Christina does the same thing. It kind of curves easily and broadly, but generally runs east-west. The White Clay, the next one north, runs also pretty much east-west until it hits Newark and then curves north from there. Smaller streams like the Mill Creek and the Pike Creek uh, generally run north-south, but they aren't as big or formidable as the Red Clay Creek. Red Clay Creek ran, runs from the Christina all the way into, New uh, into Chester County as a major stream and is deeply incised and has very strong uh, natural defensive positions along it. So if you look at potential places along the line of advance that the British forces were going to use, the red clay is the first one that you would come to below Wilmington and the closest that you could use to begin to create a defensive position, which is why Washington moved his forces into the red clay line. If you get outflanked out of the red clay line, which is what will happen on the 8th and 9th of September, the next stream you'll come to that's a basically a north-south flowing stream is the Brandywine. That's the next stream that Washington will move to, the next piece of water that he will use as a defensive position. The area of the Red Clay Creek uh, defensive line is now a heavily, heavily suburbanized area. And you can see here in this image, uh, this area has is, is, uh, got a lot of suburbanization that occurred after the, really after the Second World War, the suburban boom into areas of the, uh, uh, along the, the uh, Kirkwood Highway in the area of around Stanton. But we have some suggestion of what the area looks like and where some potential earthworks might still be located. If you look at a, a LIDAR image of that same area, Del Castle Votech High School sits here. This particular area right in here around what is now Washington Street and Lafayette Street, um, just along the red clay, Kirkwood Highway you see here, 
that's got the potential for uh, archaeological remains of where earthworks may have occurred along this property or along this area. This is uh, an image of that general location. Now it's privately owned property, so no archaeology has been done there yet, but it's a potential area that could be looked at. Um, we knew about this as long ago as the 1890s, and so the image that you see on the uh, lower left, I think that would be correct, that shows an 1890s view of, of the remnants of Washington's earthworks along the red clay. Even in the early 20th century, there's an image of a gentleman sitting there. We knew that, this, that these areas were here, that the earthworks were here, and that the, the gun battery positions were here. But into the 20th century, those areas became more deteriorated as subdivisions moved into the area. And newspaper coverage of this shows you what the area looked like and what we all thought was there, but no formal work was ever done there. State of Delaware put up a, a historical commission marker to identify these, these works uh, along the old Capitol Trail Road, that marker disappeared a long, long time ago. Uh, so actually what's gonna happen as part of the work that we're doing right now is that a new marker is gonna be placed on Del, on uh, Del Castle uh, uh, Votech High School grounds to identify Washington's camp. Uh, that should be something that happens this coming September. Now Washington decided about midnight on the 9th of September that he needed to shift his position from the Red Clay Creek up to the Brandywine. And he did this because uh, Sir William Howe and the British forces, which had been encamped at Cooch's Bridge for about five days, had begun moving out of that space on the 8th of September, a day before. Washington watches all this movement with his forces and continually sends uh, larger and larger formations or, or uh, scouting formations across the red clay to try to figure out what Sir William Howe is doing with his forces. Basically, Howe moved his men up from Newcastle, or from Newark, into the area along uh, the Mill Creek, uh, kind of along what is today U uh, uh, State Route 7, and began to, to kind of congregate his forces where he would be able to outflank Washington's position. So on the night of the 9th of September into the 10th, Washington shifts his entire army from the Red Clay Creek defensive line up to the Brandywine. And he does this by crossing with an army of about 15,000 men. So you're moving that large a force. He moves them beginning at about, uh, he makes the decision about midnight. They begin the march between about 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., depending on what unit you were in. They move by a variety of roads uh, to cross at Hollingsworth's Ford, Gibson's Ford, which is today Smith's Bridge, uh, the Corner or Chandler Ford, and Harlan Gibson's Ford. They use Center Road, Kennett Road, Starved Gut Road in Chester County, Coast Art Road in Chester County, and Piles Ford Road. Part of the work that we were doing here was to try to identify where these locations are, but essentially they use today's Center Road or 141 came up to what is now the Crooked Billet Tavern, which is located at near the intersection of uh, uh, US 52 and Route 141, turned on to what is the Kennett Road, leading to, to, uh, to what will get you to uh, Chester County and, and Kennett, and then began to branch off to take every Ford crossing they could get. By uh, midday to late day on the 10th of September, the American forces have begun to take up a position along that road. What I'll talk a little bit now about now are some of those roads and some of the information we have on those roads. And a lot of that data comes from the work of this gentleman, Amos Brinton, who was the Newcastle County bailiff and law librarian at the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century. He was a farmer who had grown up in Chester County. He was intimately familiar with the battlefield and with the grounds in the area. He talked to a lot of the people that in some cases bridged that period of time that had been alive or around at the time that the battle was fought and the forces had moved through the area. He was trying to work on a book that he was going to do about the battle. His records are actually sitting at the Delaware Historical Society. Uh, he did not do that, but his manuscript documents are there. In his manuscript documents are road maps and drawings that he identified and a manuscript document that he wrote that identifies the road systems and what he knew about Ford crossings, what troops were located where. It's a real amazing source of information that's really not been tapped very much for any history of the Brandywine battlefield. Washington's route to Chad's Ford went past Smith's Bridge. He crossed at what is today Smith's Bridge, was known at that time as Gibson's Ford, 
Uh, he would have then taken Ridge Road, which is, if you look at a modern landscape map, you can see clearly where Ridge Road crosses out of Smithsbridge Road. And then he took the Ring Road to Benjamin Ring's house. It kind of helps explain why Washington decided that his headquarters would be at Benjamin Ring's house. The road he used brought him right to that house. It's the easiest thing on a landscape when people don't know exactly where you are or how to maneuver to it, that you tell them I'm at the intersection that takes you right to that house. So the headquarters he chose is, is at Ring House. The house that you see here is the one, the Miller's house at Smith's Bridge. Um, there also is a road trace, a remnant colonial road trace uh, leading to Gibson's Ford uh, in Newcastle County. And so if you look at this image, you see the actual location of where that road is. It runs right through the middle of the slide and down here on Piles Ford Road. When the American forces uh, uh, reached the lower Presbyterian church at, uh, right across the street from what is today um, uh, Winterthur, Piles Ford Road breaks off a little bit from that space. They took Piles Ford Road, and then the old road runs right through this space. If you put that on a LIDAR map, you can clearly see the road trace here. That's the Colonial Road. That road was laid out only a few years before the, the battle and the campaign in 1777, but it was laid out by both Chester County uh, uh, inhabitants and Newcastle County inhabitants who wanted that road to get you back and forth across the Brandywine. It leads you down onto what is now US route, uh, uh, State Route 100 uh, in Pennsylvania and in Delaware. Um, but that road is still intact, and a piece of it sits in the Flint Woods Preserve. So it's actually a, a site that could be visited now where people could actually go on. And it looks something like this today. So if you're looking down the road from Center Meeting, this is what it looks like on the left. If you're looking at it from Route 100 uphill, it's very, very obvious and very, very clear. I mentioned that they crossed at a number of Ford locations, and you can see them on this 19th century atlas, beginning at the major, where the major curve is in the Brandywine, Corner Ford, uh, Smith's Bridge, or Smith's Ford, and one called Hollingsworth's Ford. Hollingsworth's Ford is shown here on the left. That is still sitting in the first, in the, uh, uh, first State National Park. That site is still there. It's still very obvious and still used today by horsemen and other people crossing back and forth across the Brandywine. It's clear from the documents that American forces used this one, they used this Ford, they used Smith's Ford, and they used Corner Ford to get across. If you look at them on an aerial image uh, that I took in 2017, you can see where Hollingsworth Ford is at the upper slide, Smith's Bridge or Smith's Ford, the Corner Ford, Harlan Gibson's Ford, and the Twin Bridges, which is the way you currently cross the Brandywine on Route 100. This is not a Ford location. It was not, and the bridges are put there at a much later date than the battle. So the principal Ford locations are what you see here in this image, and the small fragment of that uh, colonial road is shown up here in, the, in red. So the, the road that leads from uh, kind of the old portion of Piles Ford Road. So in another image of this, you see the Harlan Gibson Ford crossing today. You see it in a, a modern image here. It crosses in this spot. I mentioned in the first presentation about some of the, the roads that we have been looking at in Chester County. Cosart Road is one of those. It's an 18th century road. It would have come down uh, to what is now Route 100. You came across, and then you made a dog leg and crossed at Harlan Gibson's Ford. If you notice in the LIDAR image what the typography looks like here, that's the only spot where you could cross that Ford. This is high ground all along this ridge. There's a high ridge that comes in here, but a low crossing point right at that spot. That's what that image looks like today. Ironically, there's a gas line that crosses at the same spot right now today. But the purpose, the reason is, the same reason the Ford was there, it's the easiest way to get your gas line across the river. It's the easiest place to cross the river if you had to go by foot. Uh, there are potential picket posts or, or earthworks that were created uh, by American forces here. Now, I, I, I add to this that we haven't archaeologically examined these. These are all on private property. Uh, but these are po possible areas where there were American positions placed along the Brandywine. Uh, Washington, as early as the 24th of August, had sent uh, some uh, Chester County militia to occupy these places and to begin identifying the defensible positions. I think uh, where you see Cosart Road comes down, 
we have one that sits in this area. And if you stand in that spot, you can see literally where Cosart Road comes down and the crossing point would be above you. So this point gives you a view of that entire space. Uh, today, that's what that space looks like now. It's a large uh, depression in the ground. There's more than just one of these. There's a series of these that sit in this area as if they are earthworks built as sort of uh, uh, infantry positions to kind of uh, watch, hunker down and watch what's going on at the crossing points. If we look at the next section of the Brandywine in the Big Bend, we have Smith's Bridge location here. Uh, the corner Ford location is up in this space. If you look at that on a, on a uh, LIDAR image, you see where there's a, form, a piece of the road trace out of Smith's Bridge, a piece of road trace just below Corner Ford, possible picket posts right at Corner Ford, and the actual crossing point at Corner Ford. Those are all still on the landscape and still visible if you were to walk up in those places today. Smith's Bridge is shown in this image in the middle of the slide. That's a piece of that road that would have been on the east side of the Brandywine that would have been used by American forces. Privately owned, it's not accessible to the public. Crossing point at Chandler's Ford or Corner Ford, they go by different names depending on the time period and by, uh, in some cases, if you lived on the west side of the Brandywine or the east side of the Brandywine, uh, you depended, you know, kind of gave different names based on where you were going and who you were going to visit. So Chandler's Ford or Corner Ford is right here. It's still very obvious. It's crossing point. It's very obvious here that horses and others still use that to cross the river. Uh, you see the road uh, bed of or the road trace that would have run along the east side. And again, here's where the Ford crosses. And then these possible picket posts that were located in this place are uphill from that same crossing point. So this is where the crossing is. This gentleman's walking up to the top of the hill. And when you get up there, there are a series of these uh, kind of depressions, uh, dug positions looking right down onto the Ford. So these are clearly placed to be observation points that are looking down on the Ford. Maybe in the coming years for the 250th anniversary, this is another area that can be investigated to try to confirm whether these, that's what these are. And then if you look at this position uh, that the, uh, the Pennsylvania militia would have occupied, uh, they were the, the uh, southernmost or, or left flank of Washington's army as he had moved his forces up onto the Brandywine. This is the ridge that they occupied. You can see in this image here, the finger uh, uh, where the big bend in the Brandywine is. This is a major ridge that cuts along here. That's what this image is kind of taken from. The Brandywine runs through here, Twin Bridges is there, and the current village of Chad's Ford is in the upper corner. So this ridge is a observation point and those militia forces would have been sitting on this hill from Chad's Ford South, watching all of those potential American crossing points, or uh, uh, British crossing points, the Crown Forces crossing points, and those Fords. And so this concludes part two. Uh, and then the, in part three, we kind of had to look at this in different pieces because now I'm going to look at the movement of the British forces as they leave uh, the Mill Creek 100 area and head up to Chad's, uh, to uh, Kennett Square on the day, uh, the September 10th and 11th.